critical hybrid technology follow-up. Some of you, apparently, disagree with me on hybrids underlying energy management voodoo. And that's totally okay. If you want to be wrong, I'm completely cool with that. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where Australian new car buyers save thousands off their next new cars. Hit me up on the website for that. Got a few comments to this effect following last week's Should I Buy a Hybrid? video report. While I agree that a small diesel is best on the highway, I'd still say hybrids are better than standard petrol cars because they use Atkinson cycle engines. These engines are quite a lot more efficient than a standard petrol but are low powered for their size. This doesn't matter as they have an electric motor to help out when you need to get up to speed quickly. Okay, so up front, I kind of agree with that. If you want fuel efficiency and not performance, right? Hybrids and some other cars like the Kia Seltos with the two litre CVT powertrain, they use the Atkinson cycle. Good for economy, generally bad for performance. Atkinson, of course, is a thermodynamics hack. They leave the inlet valve open a little bit longer than usual on auto cycle engines, and this ejects, by way of contraflow, a little bit of the inlet air from the cylinder. It just contraflows back up the inlet port, and that hacks the ratio of the compression ratio to the expansion ratio for the engine. Atkinson cycle engines have less compression ratio relative to their expansion ratios and that derives a greater thermal efficiency benefit but at the expense of peak power performance because you're limiting the amount of air the engine can consume. So you typically don't see Atkinson cycle engines on exciting cars. So this business about being better really depends on whether you are performance focused or economy focused and the market does tend to be a little bit polarized like that. If you are performance focused and you deplete the battery in a hybrid, you don't get the electric powertrain's potential for additional assistance. My main point about hybrids is that the regenerative braking is how they do their energy management voodoo. It's this, and not the Atkinson cycle, which sets hybrids apart. Capturing kinetic energy under brakes and converting it to electricity and then using it to get going again. That is a hybrid car's big trick. And on the highway where regenerative braking opportunities are actually minimized, it would be better if you could simply wave Harry Potter's wand and magic away the whole electric side of the hybrid system. Just get rid of it. Because in those conditions, it really is just excess baggage. If you want confirmation of this, look up the fuel figures and compare ordinary cars to hybrids. Hybrids are generally better on fuel around town than they are on the highway. Even though urban driving is very energy inefficient intrinsically because it has lots of stop start driving, right? The latest Corolla hybrid, for example, is an excellent example of this phenomenon. It uses 10% more fuel out on the highway compared with the urban test. It's regenerative braking doing that, not the Atkinson cycle. Aussie guy 69, who we heard from initially, went on representatively enough. Just one other thing, hybrids not only charge their batteries from regenerative braking, but they also charge from the engine if it's ever running, but not under enough load to be most efficient. Then it turns the engine off and uses electricity until the battery is drained a bit, then restarts the engine and repeats the process. To be fair on this, it's only some hybrids that do that. You know, some hybrids will charge the battery using the internal combustion engine. Absolutely, no argument. Typically, these are the ones with big batteries that rely on the electric side heavily for conventional levels of motive power performance. And it's kind of a nice idea, potentially, but unfortunately, that's not an example of proper energy management voodoo. It's a compromise in hybrid vehicles where the electric side of the powertrain is designed to do a great deal of the heavy lifting. 
You really don't get a thermodynamics or efficiency benefit from doing that. I mean, if you did, it'd be great, but also a violation of the second law of thermodynamics. And that's really just a happy fantasy. Converting petrol to electricity with an internal combustion engine and a generator and then storing it in a battery simply is not a pathway to efficiency because of entropy and the irreversibility of the processes. And I blame God for this staggering universal design defect. And while we're off on this beer garden physics thermodynamics happy tangent, remapping companies all make cake and eat it too claims. The obvious one is you get more power and better fuel economy. No, sorry, not happening. One or the other, pick your poison. Yes, you can remap for extra power. Yes, you can remap for better fuel economy. However, none of these aftermarket companies had the resources to test their settings like the manufacturer does. The manufacturer supplies you the car in various states of tune and warrants it for a period of years. The aftermarket guys do not and cannot do this. Okay, so totally agreed with about half of the substance of this comment and none of the extra friggin' dots, which let's not forget, is a crime against literacy. I hate that. Three maximum. It's called an ellipsis. The overwhelming majority of aftermarket tuners do derive more power at the expense of fuel economy. That's true, but it's not the only way to do it. And if they pump this right up, powertrain components in the vehicle are often compromised hilariously enough, but that gets expensive. In particular, if you pump up the mid-range power delivery, like the torque, people call it torque, it's really mid-range power. If you pump that up in the mid-range in some diesels, like the utes, it's easy to do because that mid-range power is often capped, you know, software limited in the first place, so you just turn that off. The vehicle then goes like Superman on crack, yes, in the mid-revs. So you might be motivated then to pull a heavy load like a caravan or a boat, whatever, in a higher gear than you would with the un- tuned vehicle and you've got your blue singlet on you're pounding the out back into submission yes <laughs> and it's great right up to the point where you shred the gearbox because hey it just wasn't ever designed to endure that much torque reaction so that's nice. In the middle of the outback too I mean could be something of a weight for support don't you think? However I don't agree with Mr. Pickering's comments about power and economy being mutually exclusive propositions. That's not how this rolls. In an engine, it's more like being on a kind of three-way seesaw where you can achieve two out of three wins, but the third aspect is going to be a big loser. Okay, that's a conceptual challenge, a three-way seesaw, because usually it's one up and one down. This way, it's two up and one down every time. To derive more power and get better economy, you can do that. All you need to do is run the engine lean, like really lean. You just lean out the fuel mixture, meaning you get more air in there relative to the amount of fuel, and the mixture burns hotter and harder. This is dead simple and easy to see why you get more power. If you've ever seen the blacksmith's apprentice pumping up and down on the bellows and the coals down there, glowing white hot, well, this is kind of that, only in your engine. Same fuel, more air, more heat. It's a done deal. And the only problem with that is emissions. They kind of go through the roof. You get better power and more economy, but worse emissions. Like I said, two out of three. Volkswagen famously did this. It's the cornerstone of their black-hearted Dieselgate scandal. German bastards. Excessive air at high pressure and temperature, okay? It forces the oxygen in the air and the nitrogen to hook up, which they are generally disinclined to do, and you get shit tons of NOx, which is extremely bad for human health. NOx is a category of gases, okay? 
Incidentally, if you pump up the power and remain emissions compliant, economy is going to suck. And if you pump up the economy and remain emissions compliant, then power is going to take a direct hit. It's always two out of three, and if you're hanging onto the keyboard remapping an engine, you get to pick which two. Emissions compliance is, in my view, very important because exhaust pollution kills people, in our cities in particular. In Shkaya, exhaust pollution actually kills more people prematurely than road trauma, and this has been known for many years. So every time some imbecile on TV gets his soundbite out there about the horror road toll, I'd really suggest that they should go off and get the word imbecile tattooed on their foreheads for all the world to see. Because the real horror out there on our roads today is coming out of exhaust pipes, especially the exhaust pipes of older trucks operating on roads in our cities. And nothing is being done about that. Erzo, are you taking the piss on saying next to no sales? The current lineup of new Peugeots are selling really well under the Inchscape banner. Reliability again, you are taking the piss. I have owned seven of them and all have been great cars. Sheldon, 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 Sheldon. Seven Peugeots. Nobody deserves that, but it explains a lot, you know. What a pity you did not pay more attention at school, son, or subsequently, personal opinion. Now, apostrophes, so hard to get right. Number of exclamation points, yeah, exclamation points only for shouting, not for emphasis. If you want to emphasize something, just use more emphatic language, son. Plus, automotive pro tip, it's inch cape, no S, capital I, inch cape. It's important to get the names right, I think, you know, and maybe even the facts. Speaking of which, basic literacy is actually a very strong predictor of whether or not the substance of a comment on the YouTube comments feed is just brain fart or not. And happily, in Sheldon's case, it is. Year-to-date sales for Peugeot are 2,052 vehicles for Australia, nationally, that's nothing, I'd suggest. The same period in 2018, though, 2,325. That's almost a 12% drop over a year. The same period in 2017, 2,339, and regressing another year to 2016, same period, though, 2,857. A big drop over that time period. Overall, it's a 28% reduction in sales for Peugeot since 2016. And the brand was nowhere in 2016, let's not forget. So it's even worse than that now under capital I, no S, Inchcape. Peugeot remains a dud brand, going nowhere fast in this country that you'd buy only for some highly irrational reason, I'd suggest, such as being in love with it. Because objectively, buying a Peugeot remains a fail. 